And now we'll start our session on Swami Vivekananda and modern science. We have two very eminent speakers in this session. The first is Professor C. G. K. Murthy, a known scientist in the field of space science and physics, especially. He has been working on uh, electrical technology and atmospheric science technology. And he has been the director of the ISRO group also. And he is a present government advisor in the RCI at Hyderabad. So initially he is a product of under university, but later had his green adult and of course in the world of the institutions he got, I think it is better for me to introduce both the speakers and then after Professor Muthi, hmm, uh, Professor Ramakrishnan will be there. Professor Ramakrishnan, of course, is not uh, unknown to particularly this audience. He has been here all year also. And Professor Ramakrishnan is a very well known Indian scientist in the field of condensed matter physics. And Professor Ramakrishnan throughout initially were in Banaras. Later on, of course, he had his UCB abroad, but he had been a visiting professor in several which uh, other places and also the I received the fellowships of the Royal Society as well as the Third World Academy of Sciences and the fellow of all the three academies in India and extensively all the awards that we have got from the Shanti Shrivat Award Award to Modi Award that he has got and I think he needs no introduction. So in both this, it will be just having Professor Murthy followed by Professor Ramakrishnan and then we will have a discussion at the end. And I will be to Professor Murthy, the time is 5.15 to 6, rather 5.15 to 6. So I will be at 5 or 40 minutes, so that little bit of time is not left. Um, then we will start and then ultimately we get some time to the session. Thank you, Professor. My <coughs> pronounce for the revered marks of the order, Professor Maji, Professor Ram Krishnan, distinguished delegates, and observers of this seminar. My salutations to all of you. I am grateful to the revered Sarvabhutanji Maharaj, Chitrabhutanji Maharaj, and Mimali Chakravarti, who are really responsible for making me to come and stand in front of you, daring to say a few words, daring to say a few words. I am really grateful for them for giving me the opportunity. For the last two days, we are hearing about the multifaceted personality of Swamiji on various aspects. Today, I gently touch on the scientific aspects of Swami Vivekananda scientific aspect of Vaikam. Where the scientific aspect has come, Sri Ramakrishna <coughs> Paramahamsa by himself, a spiritual scientist, and child, one more spiritual scientist, but finally he became not only a spiritual scientist, but a real scientist too. This is how I approach to the problem. You see, he happened to be back 120, 25 years back, he went to the U.S., all of us know it very well. He happened to be Tesla, the greatest personality. After meeting the Tesla, what has happened to him in the history of the time? If you see, you make on the sword, the seeds of Vedanta in the West and scientific growth in India, with an emphasis of synthesis of East and West, is the best for the humanity for upliftment. Where do we stand here with respect to this one, as we stand? If you see Tesla understanding of Vedic sciences, his correspondence with Lord Kelvin concerning these matters and relations between Tesla 
address cell, etc., etc., and follow up. What happened finally is that it has produced. Your desk, the lectern, or the podium, or podium. It just has to shift it a little bit. Move it away. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Which is okay. Which is not okay. It has produced scientific philosophers, scientific philosophers like Schrodinger, Eisenberg, Faulkner, Hawke and Rosen, etc., etc. And then this Vedanta, when he has taken Swamiji, what has happened? Direct words of Eisenberg. <coughs> the noble logic. All the conversations about the Indian philosophy, some of the ideas of quantum physics that I seem so crazy suddenly with more sense for me. This is the thing that what has happened, which means so make on the Vedanta taking to the best, it has opened a really a new horizon, new horizon. And then what happened? One more noble logic, then he says on the occasion of the Boson, the discovery of the Boson, he says a thin line separates between the science and Vedanta. Science and Vedanta. Who is responsible for this one? 125 years back, Swam Vedanta was the first person to take the Vedanta to the Western countries, to the Western countries. And then <coughs> Swam Vedanta was the first section of the Eastern yogis who brought this Vedantic philosophy of Delhi to the West, bringing the West huge shift in thinking based on the modern science. A large number of books are written on Vedanta and science today. They continue to come even today. More than that one, I would like to say, hardly two months back, there was Lord Ardal Palena, an experiment to create the Big Bang Theory in Switzerland. And for that one, they wanted to create the matter, sustain the matter, understand the matter, and then the destruction of the matter also. Taking the clue of the science behind that one, it is a great respect that has been given to the India. They have installed the Gantaja statue in front of their temple. In the large part of Palaira, Switzerland, they have installed the Gantaja statue itself. That what it speaks, the plaza outside headquarters of the European Organization Nuclear Research, Geneva, Switzerland, has statue of women. So in this work, what it means is that which have constantly fought for millennia are now coming closer and closer. What is the millennia of fighting on the science and religion? There are two distinct things, but they are coming very, very close and closer and closer, a thin line that what it separates, and it's all the greatness of Swami Vekanda who has taken the Vedantic approach to the Western science 125 years back. And then when he went, he happened to meet, can everyone know each one? He has happened to meet the Rockefeller, and Rockefeller opened the Chicago University, and first penciling, the Nobel Prize has come out of that one. The Nobel Prize has come out of that one. And then we turn towards India, and the Indian Institute of Science, where Professor Ramakrishnan is the one of the leading professor, professor. the foundations, very foundations have come from Swami Vivekananda. In fact, Jamshidji has offered Swami Vekan that to become the first director of that institute. But Swami was much beyond all these things. He politely said, yes, it is quite, quite right, but there are the right people for the right things, and he shifted away. What it means is that Swami Vekan's vision, 125 years back, of taking the Vedanta to the West and bringing the Western science to India, has opened a really a new horizon, a new paradigm shift. It has already occurred, already occurred. And now, Swami actually where from this knowledge has come and how it has propagated. He is a Vedantist, I said, and he has been totalized under the spiritual scientist Sri Ram Paramahamsa. And Swami Vekanda, he has experienced the Nirvikalpa Samadhi, or in other words, the oneness of the entire cosmos. When he opened or closed the eyes, he found the same oneness, the same oneness philosophy that what he has taken to the Western countries. When I say the Vedanta, that oneness feature of that one he has taken to the West, and in that oneness 
he has seen the solutions about some of the solutions for the western science or in other words swamiji has interpreted the vedanta to the modern science for applicable for the modern problems and modern scientific ways of thinking so with his three science of excellence the in the domains of the physical biological and chemical sciences or really great great contributions by swamiji by swamiji <clears throat> you see how this has come on one side Swami Ji is a spiritual giant but these things are related to the external world the nature and all the other things how it has happened where we just now we heard about the intuitive science Swami Ji when he raised his mind from that of the logic reasons to that of the intuitive level he has already experienced the Jervigal Pasapali the same intuitive mind with that one, he, he know very well, Vedanta stands for the uniqueness of oneness. That Vedantic principle, he tried to intuitively couple and find the solutions to the modern problems of the world. That is how this, these things have come. And here you see some of the few examples I illustrate. In 1895, space, time, energy, matter are not only interrelated, but also that in space-time domain, energy and matter are interchangeable. Actually, the real words of Swami Vivekananda were that the absolute seen through the frame of the mind of space-time and causation becomes the oh, finite, finite. In that one, he sees in space-time, energy, matter are interrelated. This is exactly the thing which he has touched with Tesla, Professor Tesla. But fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know exactly but it is. Tesla, he could not arrive at an equation relating the energy and matter. Probably Swamiji was not really find, trying to find out a solution or a mathematical formulation. But what he says is that the energy and matter are interrelated. <coughs> they are reductionable to a single force that what he feels. What is the concept behind that one is the Vedantic concept of uniqueness of oneness of the time. And in 1905, Einstein established the grand equation E is equal to mc square, which led to a Nobel Prize. But simultaneously, a collaboration to this E is equal to mc square is, is equal to E is equal to m, which has been established by Einstein himself, which is exactly the words of Swami Vivekananda. And now, there is a universal mind, morphic mind, holographic mind. What Swami Vivekananda says, we have matter and force. The matter we don't know how this appears into the force and force into the matter. Therefore, there is something which is neither force nor matter as these two may not disappear into each other. This is what we call the universal mind. The beauty of Swami Vivekananda's language you kindly see. He is a Vedantist spiritual person and modern science, it talks about the modern language, scientific language, but if you see the language of these words, it is nothing but pure, pure scientific language of what he has used 125 years back, 125 years back. And this is what, and Tesla thinks he can demonstrate that force and matter can be reduced to the potential energy. Now, with reference to this particular thing, if we see the later science as it progressed, we have the scientists like Hohm, Brom, and Bergson, all they come converge to the same point and ultimately they're all the noble audience. So again, on this particular concept of the universal mind, there are few noble prizes in the last 125 years whose work led to almost touching to the point of the same universal mind, morphic mind, or the holographic mind. <coughs> Now, you have seen the words of Swan Brekham now. Let us see the words of the Max Planck, a great physicist, a Nobel laureate. What he says, as a man who has devoted his whole life to the most clear figured science, to the study of the matter, I can tell you as a result of my research about the atoms this much. There is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. So I'm taking the use exactly the word a force behind the energy and matter. Here also he says the same force which brings into the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. 
we must assume behind this force the existence of a consciousness and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of the matter. So here is also touching exactly the mind, universal mind, the universal force, and a single force behind that one. So the greatest correlation between of what one makes of the is using the language as third of the maximum lab, exactly you see how many similarities are there. And then I'll come to the uh, next point after the theory of relativity of the morphic mind and all the other things. Now I come to the theory of uncertainty. He has all make on that. He refers to a simplest thing. A train is there moving very fast. How fast it is moving? To find out that one, I have to have one more train which is moving a little bit slower. To have that, one more reference is required. For that one, there must be one more reference also. I keep on going, establishing a reference, fundamental reference, for finding the velocity of the train. So ultimately, it leads to the point that what Swami Vekanda has says, that what he says, when it goes to the quantum level, at that quantum level, the things become uncertain. Uncertain. So actually, as on today, I am sure Professor Sarah Krishnan will also agree with me. One of the fundamental things today, as on today, the modern science, as it evolves, the thing is, what is the limit of measurement? This is a big question mark. What is the limit of the measurement? Up to where we can go? So Ambedkar, that he says, it is uncertain. This is exactly the Heisenberg principle of the theory of uncertainty, which has led to, again, a Nobel Prize. But some of the people will say, Heisenberg, he talked with reference to the quantum, but I would say the theory of uncertainty is applicable to whatever the domain that what we would like to take. So here is one more noble price that is coming out of it. What Swam Vikanda has said, a theory of uncertainty correlated to that of the theory of uncertainty of Heisenberg. And now I come a little bit of physics. Now, Swamiji, his mind is on the biology. On the biology, each and every one of us know, even in Calcutta, there is a science museum where the Darwin's uh, thing is very pro profoundly exhibited. The theory of Darwin is that evolution, but Swamiji he has said Darwin must be true, but I would like to say evolution followed by uh, evolution followed by evolution. Darwin's theory is the evolution. But Swamiji, he slightly differs and correct saying that evolution should always be followed by the evolution. I'll come to this point a little bit later. And there is one more statement. The survival of the fittest of the struggle for the existence of Darwin's theory. Is it true to what extent? If we see Swami Vekanda, he says maybe this Darwin theory is applicable to such a level at animal kingdom or some other thing. For man, it doesn't apply at all. And what he uses the word symbiotic relationship. Kindly, some of the people who are interested in these th things, the eight volumes of Swami Vekanda, if we read that one, the language of what he has used exactly the replicate of the modern science. Swami Vekanda uses the symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic relationship that is the most important. You see now what happens? No struggle and no competition. That's what it says. Why? They know, sorry, it could be declared that struggle and competition have no special status in biological dynamics where the most important is the pattern of the relationships and interactions that exist and how they constitute the behavior of the system integrated as a whole, as a whole. You see, the Nobel laureate after seeing a successful types of investigations, Finally, what they are leading to that is that exactly is the holistic logic of molecular assembly with symbiotic cooperation. Symbiotic cooperation. And the <laughs> day of 19th of 2012, who in his wildest dreams could have imagined that beneath the crust of our earth there could exist a real ocean, a sea that has given shelter to this piece of unknown. These things are unknown to the Darwin at that time. At that time. And theory of evolution, if you try to apply for this one, it doesn't fit at all. It doesn't fit at all. Now you see, discovered in 1977 and confirmed in 2002, hydrothermal vents. In this hydrothermal vents, there is bacteria in there. And beneath the 50 feet thick of sheet of ice, 
Yes, again, vaccine guys there. If it is the evolution that has taken place on the surface of the earth, how this bacteria has penetrated deeper inside that part. Or the question is whether the life has come or generated from beneath, underneath of the earth, to that of the surface. So where is the problem exactly of this evolution thing, of how it is happening and all the other things? This is where exactly of Darwin's theory, even the latest thing of the what is evolutionary biology. In evolutionary biology, people started questioning, saying that Darwin theory, yes, evolution in principle basically is all right, but it needs to have some sort of the correction, some sort of correction. Because if it is evolution, if you look at the eye, eye has got a, such a wonderful properties of the thing, would it not have come through evolutionary, evolutionary process? It would have come on its own. And Darwin himself, he has said, if there is no evolutionary process, if there is an intelligent system, I myself will agree, saying that Darwin's theory does not apply at all. I will not go into the deep discussion of this thing, neither contradict nor any other thing, but I just simply say that the Darwin's theory, which Swam Vivekananda has referred to, and there is a dialogue between himself and his one of the disciples. There are nearly some five pages of the thing under the discussion in complete verse of Swam Vivekananda, devoted exclusively for the Darwin's theory. Darwin's theory. For the 125 years, I am very, very happy to say that what Swam Vivekananda had a vision of symbiotic cooperation, they have tended to, they have tended to, and has come to a point. Here I would say, why it has tended, what you are saying like that. McLean, last year, a German, and one more British person, I'll go back. Uh, a German and a uh, <coughs> British, uh, they wanted to find out what is the origin of the thing. It seems two cells, one cell went inside the other cell. If I apply the Darwin's theory, these two cells, they must fight with each other, they must struggle for existence, and one of them should die. But in fact, it has not happened. One of the cells that went inside the second cell, slowly it withdrew its requirements and shrunk itself and then gave that energy to the outer cell. In the process, mitochondria has formed. And that mitochondria is the basic fundamental thing for the entire life, whether it is plant kingdom, animal kingdom, or human kingdom, or whatsoever it is. This evolutionary biology, what it says is that it is cooperation and symbiosis through this experiment of the two cells, one going inside the other, establishing of that one, exactly 100% replica, duplicates of what Swami Vivekananda has said 125 years back of symbiotic cooperation and symbiosis. I turn to chemistry. Physics, he has said beautiful things, and few Nobel Prizes have come, and biology, he turned, few Nobel Prizes have come. Now I turn to the chemistry. What Swami he has said on the Chicago interest itself. Out of single element, the rest of all the elements would have come. That is the hypothesis or the vision that what, what Swami Vekanda says, and after centuries of the thing of the last one century, what they found, the fundamental element is nothing but the hydrogen. Hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. Its atomic weight is one. It has been very well established by the Aston, who has got one more book of this one. And this 85% of the whole universe is nothing but the hydrogen. Hydrogen in combination with the helium, the rest of all the other elements successively have come. There is no dispute on that one at all. So Swami Vivekananda's vision of from single element, the rest of the elements have come, have really been proven. Now I go back once again. We are on the theory of unity. Swamiji, this theory of unity, he applied for physics, so he formed theory of relativity. <coughs> he applied the unity of that one, the uncertainty. Yes, that also has come. And then in biology also, it is unity principle. And again in chemistry also, he is going towards the unity principle. So Swami Vivekananda of interpretation of the Vedanta in terms of the modern science. That is the new flood place that what has opened up. And now there is one more grand thing, the microcosm and macrocosm. Swami so, he had a vision in 
Kakul Baj, down somewhere. <coughs> yeah. I have just the passed through one of the greatest moments in my life. Here under the Tupac tree, he says, I found the same principle guarding the macrophasm. macrophasm. How does it stand? Is it real like true? Or is there any significance for this one or not? Many other people are trying to find out what is the truth behind that one. I just simply try to reinterpret the 2001 Nobel Prize. In 2011, no, physics Nobel Prize, what it says, is that the whole cosmos is the galaxies are moving away very fast. If the galaxies are moving away very fast, they are indirectly supporting the Big Bang Theory. If it is the Big Bang Theory that is supported, at one particular point of the time of origin of the time t is equal to zero and space is equal to zero, it must be a micro dot, imaginary dot. In that imaginary dot, whatever the principles of the physical, chemical and biological laws that are governing, the whole universe are also governing. So in other words, the macrocosm and microcosm are governed by the same principle. That what exactly every state is an other state. There is a universe and essentially a single quantum particle spread out in four dimensions. These emphatically substantiate against Swami's expression. Against Swami's expression. And then I'll come to one more interesting thing. Always there is a question whether it is creation or evolution. Swamiji says, don't go either for the creation or for the evolution. It is manifestation that what he says. It is the manifestation that what he says. What is this manifestation? This <coughs> string theory is acting to prana and its vibrations <coughs> are consumed by Swamiji. What is prana? Vivekananda answers, prana is pandana or vibrations. Prana means force, all that is manifesting itself as a movement or possible movement, force or attraction. Electricity, magnetism, all the movements of the body, all the movements inside the mind, all these are various manifestations of the same single thing called prana. Now, when does it stand? I just slightly, probably, I don't know what would be the reactions of Professor Sivaram Krishna because Probably each physicist he will see in his own way of interpretations of the thing. A poet writes, writes, writes the poem, but different people they can give the different criticism or different reviews and all the other things. But my interpretation is that the super string theory of what Steve Hawkins, what he is trying to bring it out, the super string theory between this and this side by side is just to see. How much similarity it says? It says when two strings vibrate and interact with each other, the vibrations manifest themselves into the entire cosmos of the thing and all the other things. Now what Swamiji says, neither creation nor evolution, but it is the manifestation. But where, where does this string theory stand today? It conclusively doesn't say, yes, string theory is the governing theory, but the recent post on of discovery of the Higgs boson two months back adds a little bit of trust for the string theory saying that yes it is very close to that of the string theory that of the string theory now Murti has said Swamiji has said in physics which has led to few Nobel Prizes in chemistry he has said Nobel Prizes are there in biology Nobel Prizes are there and he has said some manifestation of the cosmology Yes, they are also tending to where from this knowledge comes. How he has, he is intermediate and then a lawyer, but how he could make a profound statement directly <coughs> in the language of the scientific language, how he could make, what I could see is that <coughs> Swami the mastered the mind to swing from reason to that of the intuition at his own will. He got the Vedantic knowledge, thoroughly Vedantic knowledge, he has experience of the Vedantic knowledge through the Rikalpa Samadhi. Actually for the science, the best, they will not accept any scientist unless or otherwise they experience the thing or they experiment and find the results which are repeatable. Swamiji, he had the experience of that oneness of the Rikalpa Samadhi at highest level of the mind of intuition. At that intuitive mind, he knows the knowledge of the Vedanta, of unity principle. And that Vedantic principle, now when he went abroad, when he 
shorts of the UAs and all the other things at the time. Even energy, matter, how they are related, or Darwin's theory, or the chemistry, some of these things, they are st still struggling, still struggling. But Swamiji's concepts, they have gone as a pre-science. I use very carefully the word, the pre-science. This pre-science or pre-propositions or as whatever they think of the concepts they have proven. Are they really true? You see, if you look at the Copernicus and Galileo, Copernicus, when he made the concepts, he had to wait nearly 100 years till Galileo found a telescope to prove of what Copernicus he conceptualized. So on Vekanda's conceptualizations on science had to wait 125 years because at that time the instruments were not there. At that time the mathematical theories were not there. At that time these concepts are not prevent these 125 years back followed of what science followed and exactly tending to that of the Swami Vekanda's contributions. I tell you one more example, the boson recently discovered. Higgs has proposed this Higgs boson available existence maybe some 20 years back. But Higgs, he had to wait nearly for 20 years. If somebody would have asked Higgs, you made a proposal, are you a scientist? Because we could not find the Higgs, uh, Higgs boson. So your science is not science at all. Can we say it is not science? Higgs had to wait for 25 years or 30 years. And Copernicus had, had to wait for 100 years. And from big on those concepts, had to wait 125 years for getting the conceptualizations of these things. So with this, what I would like to say is that from big on those pre-science, the concepts, the hypothesis, which was directly stated in terms of the modern scientific language, had been proven in the last 125 years of the thing. In that context, I would say, so I wait on that. So far, what we call as saying that he is a modernizer, he is a nationalist, he is a some women's liberator, or some other thing, some other thing. Now I add a new dimension saying that he is a scientist, and I call him as intuitive scientist, intuitive scientist. So with this, I conclude, I conclude, I promised I wanted to keep the time. So I conclude saying that from Vivek on the gave reorientation to the modern science. He gave a reorientation to the modern science, applying of the Vedantic principles to the modern science. Let us not see the some of the mobiles or telephones or televisions and all the other things is the modern science. What I say is that understanding the fundamental laws, fundamental laws of that one is still for a man, it is a struggle. It is a struggle, but those things Swami Ji has made significant contributions. He gave a reorientation for that one. The first spiritual scientist to enunciate the, the relevance of Vedantic principles to the problems of science at fundamental level. And at fundamental level, as you can see, all the solutions are very simple. <coughs> at fundamental level, all the solutions are simple. E is equal to M, simple, very simple. Now, manifestation, very simple. One element has brought the rest of the element. Very simple. Even the normal, common man can understand this language of this one. This is what exactly Swami Vekanda has said. The Vedanta must be translated and tested by the signs so that even a common man can understand. This is what exactly happened. Finally, his pre science has been indicated with the scientific developments taken place in the last 125 years. His concepts on consciousness and manifestations or the converging point. This is exactly the place of him. Maybe in the last four years or five years, there were debates on consciousness. And consciousness, many of the scientists, national, international scientists, are coming to a converging point. And in modern physics, I again refer to Professor Rogerson. The role of the observer and observed is slowly disappearing. Slowly disappearing. And then, the matter away from it originated, it is tending towards matter more slow, 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 and consciousness, it is tending to, it is tending to. But finally, probably, I have to remember the story of Sri, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Why? The reason is that this is a relative word. The science is also relative. But except the transcendental science, which is absolute, the relative science, it is a relative. Why? Sri Ramakrishna says, a salt bomb wanted to measure the depth of the sea. 
it went backwards, what happened? They solved the argument with this thing. So also the scientist is trying to find out the underlying truth behind the externals. Then after where he will go, he will go to the limit of measurement. The limit of measurement is uncertain. At that uncertain point, the observer becomes the observed and the same silence will be there. And what the, so some of the scientists, pseudo-scientists I would call, or synthism I call, who question the transcendental knowledge of inner knowledge, where it is verifiable, where it is experienceable. Now, for the science also, the same problem is coming. So the science and religion, the demarcation, the lines or arrays, it is all due to the great, great contributions of Swami Vivekananda. With this, I profoundly thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity of putting forward some of my views. I am very sure, and some of these thoughts I have taken to the Max Planck Institute. I have taken to some other universities also, and they also converge to the same thing. So with this, I bow down to the great personality of Swami Vivekananda, the Swami Vivekananda, before there was no Swami Vivekananda, and later now, whether there will be a Swami Vivekananda, I am not very sure, that's why probably the reason why Swami Vivekananda has said, one more Swami Vivekananda has to born once again to understand what this Swami Vivekananda has done. So a little bit of understanding as a student of this one, this is the revelation that has come all towards the science of Swami Vivekananda. Thank you all, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Murthy, for the extremely scintillating address and uh, um, especially clarifying as to how our Swami's reality concept has been treated in the Western science and the pre science concepts led to the scientific developments in the Now, I thank you once more, and I now have the uh, presentation of Professor Ramakrishnan, then we will have a discussion.